today is uh, Ikram, who's a partner in the immigration uh, and employment team, is going to be asking questions to Leah and I, and we'll just go back and forth. It's, you know, there's, it's a fairly small group today, so if you just want to, if anyone's got any questions as we're going through, feel free to, to shout out or uh, interrupt by all means. And if not, um, or you've got an additional question that's not, not covered, you either ask it at the end or you just type it in the in the chat box and we can try and deal with it. As I say, I think it'll be about half an hour um, and hopefully you can find it helpful. It is being recorded if you need to pass it on to anybody um, today. So, um, as you know, I'm Paul Hennessy, I'm a solicitor in the employment team and Leah Edwards is now a solicitor as well. Um, I've recently qualified and um, Ikram is here as one of the partners in immigration. So, Ikram, do you want to just uh, fire away? Yeah, thanks, Paul, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. As Paul has mentioned, um, so if anything comes up you're not sure about, just, just feel free to uh, pop the questions again in, in the chat box. Or actually, it would be really nice if, if, if you want to sort of ask the questions at the end so we get a bit of more interaction that way. So that would be really nice as well. Uh, so the first um, question that we really had was, as Paul, um, just asking about a brief summary of the current working guidance. So if you could just provide a brief summary on that, please. Sure, yeah, yeah. So um, obviously, we were initially on plan A, which was a fairly um, wide um, set of um, well, restrictions. It was, it was, we were almost tipping to back to normal, but we did have plan B hanging over us. And obviously plan B was introduced by Boris Johnson on the 8th of December, um, which changed the uh, guidance in respect of work to encouraging people to work from home. And, and actually a recommendation is they should work from home where possible from the 13th of December, which was Monday. Um, anybody who cannot work from home, employers are expected to make sure that workplaces are safe uh, to do so. And we'll touch upon how we do that in a moment. Um, anyone who cannot go from home, of course, should still go to work and is expected to go to work. Maybe reasons behind that, for example, they may not be able to do their job. Certain jobs obviously can't be done from home and, and that's, that, you know, there's no, we haven't had any closures of, of sectors yet is obviously still up and running and, and seems to be relatively uh, normal, albeit masks are, are obviously required by staff. Um, you know, also it's uh, other 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 things that perhaps circumstances where there's people who can only do part of their job at home and they can be, need to do, go to the office or place of work for um, support with IT or other equipment that they need to access and do their job fully. So um, there is in recommendations that staff should have regular lateral flow tests if they are to be regularly attending the workplace. Um, and that's to obviously manage the risk of them, themselves contracting COVID and also managing the risk of spreading it to others. Under current rules, we're looking at plan B for six weeks. So that takes us forward to the middle of January um, with a review after three weeks. Um, I have to say, my personal view is that it will be beyond that um, given everything that particularly Chris Whitty said last night. Obviously, also other recommendations is encourage so social distancing. Uh, if for those who can't who can't work from home, um, masks are also encouraged, but okay, not mandatory. Um, and as I say, should working from home is not must work from home. It's not quite what we had uh, back in March 2020 or even the start of this year. But it is very much a focus on encouraging employers to to, to do their best to allow staff to work from home and to keep everybody safe. Thanks for that, Paul. Um, right, the next question I've got in is, so it's asking, what happens if an employee is demanding to work from home, but the business is unsure? Thanks, Ikram. So as Paul has just said, the current advice that people should work from home, but only where that's possible. So my advice would be to um, consider the requirements of the job, consider any health and safety and COVID requirements, conduct risk assessments, and provided the employer thinks that it is safe and there's a business need for employees to come in, um, then they should do so. At present though, many employees are likely to be reluctant to come into the office due to concerns about the current variant and they want to stay at home um, so they can enjoy Christmas. Um, other employees may just be anxious about attending the workplace and employers should be cautious that anxiety in itself could amount to a disability and of course there are potential discrimination concerns arising from that so in that situation employers should be aware that they would need to make reasonable adjustments but there's always a fine line that needs to be struck employers need to balance the needs of the business 
against the associated risks arising from COVID. Um, employers should avoid knee-jerk reactions and should consult openly with employees about their concerns and how their concerns could be addressed or how they've already been addressed during previous restricted periods or through previous risk assessments that have been carried out. Um, in respect of consequences, provided the employer has considered the request to work from home, but it is determined that this is not possible, where the employee does not in fact have a reason to um, want to work from home um, and to not attend the office, but it's necessary for them to be in the office to fulfil their duties, the employer may be justified in carrying out a disciplinary process for the employee's failure to follow instructions or for the employee's unauthorised absence. But one thing to just take from everything I've just said is I always recommend that everyone should keep contemporaneous notes of any discussions had with employees about these concerns, along with any discussions that they've had in the background to show their rationale for making those decisions. Thank you, Leah. Um, Paul, the next question that I've got, I think you've partly touched on it really, but if, if, if you could elaborate from what you've already said, um, it's asking what about if they can't do um, parts or then all of their job from home. So if there's part of the job that they can't do from home, um, what are the what are the recommendations then? Yeah. So obviously, if you literally can't do your job from home because you work in a factory or you work in a in hospitality, and obviously you know, those types of jobs can't cannot be done um, remotely, and, and you need to be there in person, then obviously the requirements are are, are there, and you have to take the relevant risk assessments. Um, but I think I think the, the question really focuses on, on those who are, are able to do part of their job at home and part of it um, uh, is needed to be done at the place of work or, for example, be able to go out um, you know, on the road or, or travel to, to meet clients or customers or whatever. So um, there may be a reluctance from those staff who want to um, spend all their time at home um, that then but if you as a business require them to do some of the job at home, then I think really the best way to deal, deal with that, and if you're getting any pushback, is to sort of have a sit down, meet with them, have a discuss whether a compromise can be reached and say, look, well, we need you to do this. Uh, we're happy for you to work from home for this part of your job, say three days a week, but we either need you in the office two days a week, or we need you to go on the road, or we need to go and meet customers face to face. And these are our business reasons why. Now, provided you can set out those business reasons and you're happy with them, then I think you're unlikely to face um criticism obviously provided you've done appropriate risk assessments now there may be reasons for that well as i said relationship with customers relationships with clients may be may require that you need to facilitate um face-to-face -face meetings obviously things like construction hospitality um uh, uh, and you know, entertainment so like football um you know People have got to go there to, to work and there's something that can be done, but obviously, you know, encouraging masks and things and, and showing what you're doing actively to the staff to keep them safe is really important. Things that we've done at Aaron's over the time, we've had roses. So, you know, you're in your days in the office are Tuesday and Thursday, for example. Um, or if you aren't going to have a former rota and you want people to go in uh, or allow people to go in from time to time as required, then make sure, you know, you're keeping a, a um, a sort of a log or a record of that and making sure that that's being managed so you're not having everybody going in at the same time to so try and restrict the numbers and say well this is your time that you'd like or there's so many people are going in that day so you'll have to go at another time type thing um and then yeah and, and that's and then just obviously it once they are in and if they are working whether they wear masks to walk around the building whether they um do what's necessary to keep two meters apart obviously lots of people have had like tape or one-way systems things like that to, to, to support so so basically, yeah, it, it goes back to business needs. If the provider that you can show a business need for them to come in part time, um, then um, you're OK, of course, subject to the safety precautions being in place. Thank you. Um, Leah, the next question I've got is, is what if the employees make requests that you cannot provide? So, for example, demanding to sit next to an open window or maintain social distancing? Um, in, in that sort of situation, what, preca what precautions would you um, sort of put in place? So this can be a difficult one. When employers are requiring employees to come into the office, then it's very likely that they will request that certain measures are put in place. Um, 
we know about reasonable adjustments in disability, but even if people do not have the legal definition of a disability, then they, they're, they're still entitled to make uh, requests for their own health and safety because of COVID concerns. Again, anything that's put in place will stand back to any risk assessments that you've carried out and reassuring staff that the workplace is safe. But provided that the employer has been reasonable when carrying out its risk assessments, um, we don't see any issue for re refusing specific requests. There are alternative precautions that employers can put in place. Paul has touched on, upon a few of those already. But if somebody can't sit next to an open window, for example, you can still ensure that the uh, workplace is still well ventilated. And other measures can include the obvious, such as wearing masks, um, helping to promote social distancing by secluding teams. So in our place of work, we've actually divided the building into different teams and we have different entrances and exits that certain teams can go into. So you can't go into another exit. You can't cross teams just to help prevent the spread amongst the different teams. Um, reduce staff in the workplace and, as Paul said, have rotors in place so that only a limited amount of employees are in the office at any given time. Um, some further requirements could be to require staff to do lateral tests before they come into the office. And another thing could be encouraging vaccines, but I won't go into detail on that because Paul is going to touch upon that later on. Um, just a general point point to note is that any failure to follow COVID workplace health and safety guidance could result in employees alleging that em the employer has breached its implied duty um, to take reasonable care of the health and safety of employees. So just something to bear in mind why it's so important to make sure those measures are in place. And if employers feel like they need further guidance, um, there are specific sector guidance um, pages on the government website that's a good reference point. In other words, it, it would actually be also a good idea to, to do some training if, if on health and safety guidance, just to make sure that they're up to date if, if something's missing there. Then. Yes, and just make sure that risk assessments are reviewed on an ongoing basis, because obviously the guidance is changing all the time, business needs are changing. So just make sure that they're up to date. Like old ones may still be relevant, but small things may need to be changed. Thank you. Um, Paul, the next question, it's really interesting because I think we've all heard this. Um, so what they're saying is, is, what if the staff can work from home, but management um, do not want them to? So the, and, and then the comment that I've got is that the pubs are open after all. So, you know, why can't the workplace be? Yeah, I mean, I have to say that this is probably the most um, sort of common problem that we, we've dealt with, the most common query that we've dealt with in the last couple of weeks is that um, a lot of businesses want the staff in the office um, or in the place of work, despite the guidance. Um, now, reasons for that are um, perhaps being a little tired of restrictions and, and COVID and, and sort of envisaging that we might be on the um, sort of way out of it. Um, obviously, the rollout of the vaccines, which has been successful, has given people more confidence um, and, and employers really are reluctant or a lot of employers have been reluctant to sort of force um, or to yeah to want staff to go back to working from home, sort of seeing a bit of a step backwards. Um, obviously, we know what the guidance is, and we've touched on it. Should work at home if you can. Um, the concerns obviously also surround about you know do pe are people concerned about staff morale? Are they concerned about um, productivity decreasing? Um, and do they just generally feel that you know they can manage staff better um, face to face? And uh, and you know that and given that if they do take appropriate steps in the workplace to make sure that it's safe, then um, that they see that as enough. Now, obviously, this kind of train of thought was is based on my advice I've been given over the last couple of weeks. It does appear to be getting slightly more serious than we thought. But a lot of the, a lot of the um, sort of employers' views has been, well, you know, if you look at you know, city centres on a Saturday or Friday night, if you look at restaurants, um, if you look at the football stadiums, how on earth can all that be allowed when, you know, I've got a, a team of 15 or 30 people in an office and they've all got to work from home. It doesn't appear to make a lot of sense. Plus the fact it doesn't really help when the uh, Prime Minister and his government are sort of saying that, you know, work from home, but still go to a Christmas party and all that sort of nonsense that we've had to deal with in the last few weeks um it, it, it there does appear to be a bit of a lack of clarity but what i would say uh, really is uh, you know the the guidance is there for a reason 
um, and, and you know, failing to follow government guidance does put you at risk of losing trust of staff, and obviously potential health and safety breaches, etc., leads to on discrimination. Um, I think, really, it's probably unwise to consider a blanket refusal across the board um, and just say everyone needs to be in the office because we that's our view. Now, I don't think realistically it's going to be too hard to present a business case to force staff to be required to attend the office um, because ultimately it's the, the tribunals and the law doesn't tend to want to interfere with um, kind of business decisions and how people should run their businesses. Um, but failing to do to, to, to follow the guidance, of course, does promote risk. And if there's people who are more vulnerable than others, people who are more concerned than others, then it does create employment problems. And obviously, employment problems can result in, in claims. So if you are keen for everybody to, to keep coming in, then, you know, provided you can show a business case, then I think that's fine. But I think it would be unwise not to sort of consider everybody on a case-by-case -case basis and actually appear to be flexible because, you know, I, I don't think long-term it's in everybody's interest to... Um, to sort of ignore the guidance and it's not probably going to come across very well as an employer and obviously if if you do have an outbreak then you know you might end up with not very many staff being able to work so there is that side of it too uh, which doesn't seem to be considered as much as the desire for everyone to be in but anyway that's 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 it so you can do it I, I, you know i'm not going to sit here and say don't follow the guidance because that's clearly what is there for but you know if you if you do think your business does require that then provided you've considered everybody's personal circumstances on a case by case, or if people are coming to you saying, I need to work from home because, you know, these are my concerns. And I think particularly before Christmas, you know, we are now in the period where if you if you test positive, uh, you're on a, in isolation over, over Christmas day. So, you know, even if you wanted to perhaps do it for this period and see how things are in January, it might be better. But uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I think it just goes back to the point that Leah made um, about the risk assessment, not just from, from that perspective, but you've just got to be a bit more careful in, in, in terms of that as well. So to make sure the risk yeah, assessment yeah, is done properly, because our outbreak would then cause a bigger problem, not just the fact that you may potentially have claims against you, but at the same time, if, if your staff can't work, then that's that's a really good point you made there. Yeah. Um, Leah, can I put the next question to yourself? It's, it's, it's looking at it from a, a slightly different view from, from the one that we've just had. Um, so it says, what do we... Um, do if, if some employees want to come into the office, but to do so is against the guidance and management would prefer them to be at home? Thanks. So obviously this is the completely other perspective is what Paul's asked. So in this situation, management want the employees to stay at home, but the employees want to go in. So first of all, the guidance does say, just to repeat what we've already said, that employees should work from home where that's possible. So you would have to assess the reason for the employee wanting to come into the office. If it's simply down to a personal preference, but they are able to perform their job from home, then the starting point is that they should work from home. And you would be breaching the current restrictions by allowing them to come in. But obviously, it's just weighing up all of the reasons put forward by the employee. Um, most employers seem to be taking the view this time that it's actually up to the employee to decide whether they should work from home or not. And provided it's safe to do so, um, we consider this to be a sensible approach. But you should just ensure that employees are aware of the guidance. And if there are a lot of employees, don't just let them all come in at once. A rotor would seem sensible. And that would avoid the risk that Paul's just said, that if you allow everybody in and everybody gets COVID, then you haven't got a workforce. But even though I've just said that if it's simply a personal preference and management want them to stay at home, then this would point towards them staying at home. You should also be aware of less obvious situations. So in the first pandemic, statistics show that domestic violence, domestic violence um, hugely increased. Um, so just be aware of situations like that. And in this situation, employers might actually want the employees to come into the workplace and that would allow them to have open discussions with employees and just to refer them to the appropriate help. So just a little side point to consider when you're like looking into an employee's reasons for wanting to work from home. Yeah, just to follow up there, I think I think you know some some people might actually feel that they can work more efficiently uh, in in the office. Um, the more the productivity is higher, they might have a more um, you know a better setup sort of in terms of a, a desk. You know, in in the absolute. Uh, worst parts of the lockdowns um 
you know, people were working on the dining room table or in the bedroom and all things like that because they didn't have a, like a workstation. Um, you know, that that kind of thing this time is is seems a bit um, extreme. Obviously, we, again, not going against the guards, but if people think, you know, I'd rather come to the office, I'll wear my mask, I'll, I'll follow the rotor, um, and the employer's happy with that, then I, I think that's quite not a bad idea. So much in the same way that I said, um, you know, don't have a one one rule uh, approach for all. You know, on, on the other side of the coin, it's, this question is dealing with, you know, consider that as well. You know, are the circumstances where people might feel actually it's better for that person to go go in even three days a week? And obviously mental health, you know, it's people who live on their own, people who, um, you know, have got very small children who are going to have... Um, you know, Christmas holidays coming up, are they actually going to be able to work if, um, you know, they're, they're on school holidays, they haven't got childcare, all those things are going to be relevant at the moment. So, again, as I say, just just think of everybody's circumstances before you kind of make these policies. It's a good point, and I think I'm a classic example of, of somebody who doesn't like to work from home, so I, I like to get into the office when I can. And that's where Adam and I are sort of managing the, the Manchester office side of things. We, we've got a road test of making sure that we're not in on, on, on same days where it can be avoided. So that's 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 been helpful as well. So yeah, I, th I think I'm an example of somebody who likes to go in. So that might have been a question I would have put forward anyway, if if, if it wasn't on there. Uh, Paul, can I give the next question to yourself? Uh, yeah. So it says staff have seen the return of working from home as a blow to morale. So yeah. what can we do to maintain this? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's certainly, I mean, it's not just a, a blow to morale to, to, to staff and employees. It's, it seems a blow to morale to the nation that we've, we've seemed to be heading in the right direction and we're doing a very fast U-turn. Um, it is disappointing and obviously there's nothing we can do about that. Um, but what, what, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure everyone's sick of um, team quizzes. Um, I don't definitely... I'm sure the IQ of the nation must have increased significantly in 2020, given all the questions. I um, don't know how many times I got asked who shot John Lennon, but um, the, the you know the, you can do things. I think I think in terms of sort of management um, of staff, regular contacts are the most important. Phone calls, video calls. If you are all working from home, particularly I think particularly one to one is is important. Um, you know we've got a team WhatsApp group which between work and kind of you know people doing fun things we did have a um you know a, an employment team night out a few weeks ago before all this, this court kicked off that's at the end of november uh, and it, to be honest it did kind of feel like we were back to normal and they certainly you know it's great for team spirit to be able to do those things we then had a, a you know an aaron and partners proper staff party for the whole firm which was which was pulled um about a week before because it just didn't seem right um, to be to be mixing in that in that kind of way on a large scale. So um, I won't comment on the guidance regarding parties. It does seem to stand in the face of everything else the same. But um, yeah, the, 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 those types of things. Obviously, there's the social socially distance events. Things like walk can be done if, if staff live nearby to each other if they are working from home. But just think, making sure welfare, general welfare, is being managed. Um, keeping in touch is all, all you can do. And I say, of course, if you do want to do a quiz, I'm sure you might get about three people joining. Oh. Um, the next question, again, I think we have touched on it again, but if, if Leah, you could add um, to, to what's already been said. Um, so are there any general reminders for staff who have reverted to working from home? Yeah, so the first thing to be clear of is where the employee can actually work. So even though there seems to be less restrictions in going to the pub than there are to go into the workplace, make it clear that employees should be working from home and not in public spaces where people can like overlook and see what they're actually doing. Um, these, I think this is all very like common sense approach, but make sure employees are reminded of the data protection policy and ensure that they are aware of their confidentiality provisions. So just as a reminder to employees, you may wish to send a copy of the policy out to everybody by email and just ask for a quick email confirmation that people have read and understood um, the terms of that policy along with their obligations. Um, and again, just a few common um, sense factors and measures to help ensure confidentiality. Remind employees to change their passwords on a regular basis. Uh, reminding employees that they can only do work on their employers designated secure systems, reminding employees to keep any personal data separate from any work data and to make sure that they're locking away any of that data when they're not working. 
And yeah, so just making sure that employees are aware that papers just can't be left around everywhere. So just the general confidentiality provisions, they'd be a good reminder to let the employees. I think particularly with it being the time of year where you might have visitors, family and friends, but when you don't want to be leaving your confidential um, documents on the dining room table or you know, on the sideboard or wherever, um, it's, I think it's probably best to make sure that, that you know, they are filed away in an appropriate place. Now, no doubt your um, privacy notice or GDPR policies will refer to that, but you know, most of the time the staff aren't actually fully aware of what those policies say. So just you know, gentle reminders, as Leah said, you know, maybe just maybe just like a brief email with a with a check of reminders or working from home reminders type thing, um, which can be tied into other things, as I said, you know, keeping in touch and that. So uh, yeah, that's that. Okay. Uh, next question, Paul. Um, would it be possible for employees to argue that their place of work had been changed by custom and practice? So if they now um, return to working from home? Uh, this is the interesting question um, because um, many will say that the way of working has changed for good since coronavirus hit. And um, the kind of traditional, everyone goes to the office nine to five or nine to half five or whatever, um, days are, are done. I don't know where they are. We'll have to see. I think there was a real appetite to get back to work. Certainly social advantages, training advantages, and just general, um, you know, staff and client relationship management is, is far easier and better face to face. Um, but arguably, yes, I think I think is the answer to the question. I, th I think if people have worked at home for the best part of eighteen months, or or you know, because even now, when there's people that in our in our in our rooms who are reluctant to come in regularly even even in the summer when it felt like it was getting back to normal they still decided that they felt you know the circumstances around that perhaps um are pregnant or partners are pregnant or you know got family members who are poorly or they live with vulnerable uh elderly parents or they've got children who might be vulnerable you know all those all those circumstances which didn't go away just because the you know you know the the, the numbers were dropping um and i think ultimately yes i think i think we will see that um we have uh, potential for, for terms to be implied into contracts now. Indeed, in Europe, and I think in Germany, uh, they're actually considering making it a statutory right to work from home, um, which is really interesting, something that we have not seen yet. And obviously, as no longer uh, members of the European Union, um, that won't directly impact us unless uh, our government decides that that's the way forward. Um, uh, so, but yeah, I mean, if you think of how implied terms are implied into employment contracts, custom and practice, you know, a period of 18 months is, is a long time and, and that, that certainly could um, could be a way that we go and it'll be really interesting to see if the tribunals you know if that point is considered in the tribunal in the future you know if someone says well you I'm now I've worked for home for 18 months or two years by the time we get out of Omicron um, and then we, we you know I, you're now demanded to come back to work as we were pre-pandemic and I resign and I say that's a breach of contract quite interested to see how the tribunal um interpreted that probably if i had to nail my colors to the mast i think the tribunals would side with the employer just from a kind of public policy can't have everybody resigning at the same time saying they want to work from home type of view but i think generally across the board employers will go with a flexible approach where, where it's possible so people you know people who work in an office like, like we do i think a, a flexible approach is going to be very much the way forward because it does seem to work um for everyone um and, and i think i think that's that's yeah where, where we'll end up thank you uh next question leah um it's a strong word in there so i'll, I'll give you that warning first it's, it's how do you enforce um, compliance to work hours for employees working from home. So I think enforcement might be how do you make sure, uh, rather than sort of enforcement of it, but yeah, make sure, how, how would you make sure compliance to work hours for employees working from home? Yeah, so I think the theme throughout this webinar is that one, a one a, the same approach doesn't apply to everybody. So again, it will all depend on the individual circumstances, but depending on the employee's job and experience, you could hold regular meetings with employees. So for example, you could have a meeting first thing in the morning and at the very end of the day to monitor progress. 
but that might not be the most obvious thing because a lot of employees may require flexible working um, in light of the current situation. So they may require that for various reasons. So they may have childcare commitments. As Paul just mentioned briefly earlier, they may have a family member that's poorly or somebody might need to pop out to get their vaccine. And every time I've had my vaccine, there's been a huge queue. It's not just a case of running in and out. So if employees do require flexible working, employers should have clear discussions with the employee about that, um, just to make sure that everybody's singing from the same hymn sheet. And a lot of clients at the moment are imposing trial periods to see whether this flexible working does work and having regular meetings throughout that trial period to take back feedback to see if it's working for all parties. And it's advisable to just have a flexible working policy if you don't already have one um, get in light of the current situation. And this is something we can actually help with. So I think the main thing to take from that is that there is a general need to be flexible, although this is a lot different to the first time this all came about. And I think employers are a lot more accommodating to flexible working now. It's not such a novelty anymore. So I think employers have had to adapt and become good at that. It would have been interesting that if, um, you know, you'd gone to a business in March or February 2020 and said, oh, well, what do you think about telling everyone to go work from home? They would have probably said, absolutely not. Are you mad? And then suddenly it was like forced. I can remember our financial director, Evans, just saying that we literally had to get 140 people working from home in two weeks. We had to do. We had no choice. Now, how long would that have taken a business if they'd had to sort of roll it out and change the contracts and consult with the staff and get all the IT? But it is amazing that everybody just actually managed to do it. And we are fortunate that we have got the technology um, that allows us to do that. You know, have this happened even 10 years ago, I think it would have been a real struggle for, for everybody. Um, so, yeah, one thing to, to be cautious of on that is actually is monitoring staff, though, because you can only monitor staff where it's reasonable. And if if you are kind of, you know, logging in to see what people are doing on their computers whilst they don't know you what you're doing, like a sort of not spying, but checking up on people, um, that, you know, unless you've got a really good grounds for that, much in the same way as you shouldn't really be watching staff on CCTV from, a, from an office on a, you know, on a, outside or in a warehouse type scenario, um, because there has to be trust between the parties. And obviously, if you've got concerns that they, they, they're taking advantage of the working from home because, you know, watching Cheltenham or something on a, on, a, on a Wednesday afternoon when they should be working, then that's different. But if you haven't got concern, legitimate concerns, you know, just keeping regular contact, sort of deadlines to feedback, what, you know, what have we done today or what have we done this week type conversations, not literally watching them and, you know, seeing their productivity because that just, uh, you know, damages morale, damages trust. And ultimately, if people aren't happy, then they might quit and claims obviously can arise out of that. Thanks for that, Paul. And, and, and sorry, finally, uh, I think, Leah, you've already passed this question on to, to Paul already, haven't you, uh, at the start? So, um, Paul, have you got any tips about dealing um, with anti-vaxxers um, in a workplace? So, so any tips that you could give, please, in, yeah. in how you would handle that sort of a situation? Well, I have to say it's very, very tricky because um, the in my experience of dealing with people who are anti-COVID, anti-vaccine, don't believe in it, is that their view is absolutely their view and there's no um, sort of any way that they will you know, compromise or be willing to listen. So it is very, very difficult. Um, in terms of the vaccine itself, um, Adam and I did a separate webinar, which is on uh, YouTube, which you can watch about um, dealing with those who are unvaccinated. And the general general guidance is what we could care, all we could go as far to say is unless you're in one of those sectors, which... Um, is having mandatory vaccines. Obviously, we've already got care in care homes. And um, from March, um, it will be the NHS staff all will be required to be vaccinated, double vaccinated and possibly even triple vaccinated or boosted, um, albeit with a 12-week grace period from, uh, is it March or April? I'm not sure. But um, the uh, is, is, to, is to encourage, pr present the government guidance, present the medical guidance, which is readily available, um, and ultimately, if people are unwilling to 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 take the vaccine, then um, and if you feel that it, it is damaging or causing your staff to people's at risk, then ultimately you may feel that you may may need to take a decision to terminate employment based on that. It's probably risky, 
Um, but ultimately it's your business and you you would have to bear that risk if you felt that you they were putting staff or themselves in more danger. Again, that's untested in the tribunals for obvious reasons. Um, but um, I would be surprised again if the tribunals were going down the side of dismissing um, uh, people for not being vaccinated was unfair, of course, unless all the circumstances of that individual um, had not been considered. So, for example, are they pregnant? Are they? Do they have a condition which means that the vaccine may react differently? Do they have a religious belief why it might not be? Um, um, you know, something that, that they, they want to do, um, and that all the pride that's all considered rationally and fairly. Potentially, it could be a reasonable ground for dismissal in the future. I think. Um, the the other side of it is, of course, is the kind of conspiracy type. Uh, it's a load of rubbish. It's a, it's it's a you know it's been made in some factory and it's just or it's um, on all, all these types of theories uh, or in fact it doesn't exist at all and it's just people putting pressure on us to change our way of life. Um, then that is a is you know I think probably easier to deal with than the the, the vaccine because. Um, that is not the review of the government, not the view of the masses. Um, and I think if that, if people were perhaps, you know, refusing to wear a mask, refusing to social distance, refusing to work from home, just generally spouting nonsense about COVID not being a real thing, um, then that could potentially be cause for disciplinary or, or probably more sensibly grounds for some other substantial reason that it's actually no longer practical for them to remain in the business. Obviously, that again, all factors need to be considered. Anti-vaxxers will definitely be relying on um, um, a, a genuine philosophical belief that they that COVID is real. I cannot, for the life of me, see a tribunal siding with that view and saying that that is a, 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 a protected characteristic. But it could be argued, and of course, what we don't want is claims in the first place. Um, so obviously there's ways out of existing staff who, who may be awkward, set on to etc. But um, it can be done. It's very difficult. I was dealing with it earlier this week. And, you know, the, the nonsense in an email I read was just, you know, beyond beyond belief. How was it, you know, law from the 1700s, the Magna Carta, the Nuremberg Code, um, all things. Basically, it's basically law, the uh, relying on law that hasn't been repealed, but is basically dead in the water so um it, it's very difficult and but it, i think the, the biggest problem in france is just general disharmony general difficulties managing staff um yeah it's a tricky one i just wanted but, to add a bit. sorry sorry, well, I'll, I'll, sorry carry on Leah. go Sorry, so even if you have a fair reason for wanting to dismiss somebody, so for example, it's mandatory that they have the vaccination and they don't, or you think it's necessary for health and safety that they do, and um, just make sure that you follow the usual process that you would. So by following the usual process and by holding the meetings in line with that process, you'll be able to fully understand like the employee's concerns. So I think it's just important that you have those discussions. And I think we've said it a few times, don't just make a knee-jerk reaction and make sure you fully investigate things before making decisions. Thanks for adding that. And, and I was just going to say, you mentioned, um, you know, the, the other sort of um, HR lunch clubs and then webinars that you have done. And it's interesting on, on, on that anti vaxxers point is, is the social media one that you did, because, you know, sometimes I come across posts on, on LinkedIn and, you know, you can identify and you think, wow, for an employee to put something there because the, the employer's details are there as well. So there are some interesting comments that go on there. Do you have any tips in, in, in terms of just quick to add in, in terms of what employers could do about social media posts that, that, that go on as well? Yeah, or? it's a tricky one. I mean, not COVID related, but I dealt with some of this morning already on that, where the employee decided to tweet the, um, the business and the local newspaper about their dissatisfaction of their experience that they'd had. Um, social media policies will be in place. There's obviously protections in those about bad mouth in the company. Um, again, reminding staff that if they are presenting themselves on social media as an employee of X company, uh, then they, that can be seen as the company's view. And therefore, I wouldn't, you know, that would not be condoned and remind the staff that uh, that is definitely, if they are to have um, these kind of views, you'll see a lot of the people who are on the BBC, Gary Lineker, Graham Norton, that they have on their Twitter, ha Twitter handle, um, these views are my own, not that of my employer. And that, you know, that 
kind of carves them out of any liability in respect to the BBC. Um, but yeah, it, it, all, all you can do is remind staff, have the policies, and yeah, and think if they are uh, posting um, misguided, shall I say, uh, information, then you just remind them that, that they need to make it very clear that that is the view, their personal view and not the view of the business. Yeah. Paul, and finally, just quickly, I know we're, we're short of time, and mm -hmm. we've had a, a question in the chat box um, from iPhone. Um, is mm -hmm. lower productivity that impacts the business a good enough reason to say working from home is not an option? So this was seen in previous lockdowns. Yeah. Um, yes, in some in short answer, I think if, you, if your business is not as efficient as it is when everybody's working in the in the office compared to when everybody's working from home, then um, that is a good reason. That is a clear business reason. Now, that needs to be beyond the perception. That needs to be genuine. And excuse me, if you can show um, that, you know, these were our figures in when everyone was working from home and these were them when everybody was in the office, then provided you're taking the appropriate measures to keep staff safe, then yes, I absolutely think that that would be a reasonable ground to get staff in. Thank you. Um, okay. Yeah, um, if, if anyone has any other questions that they'd like to ask Leah or Paul directly, um, yeah, just feel, feel free to ask them now. It would be nice if you could put them on the spot. <laughs> That's normally your job. <laughs> <laughs> no, but obviously, if anyone's got any questions that, you know, that come up after this, certainly drop us an email. You, you have all our details, hopefully. Um, but yeah, um, it, it will be will it has been recorded this and will be available on YouTube and obviously shared on LinkedIn, uh, etc. So um, that's pretty much it. So thank you for attending um, and hope everybody keeps safe and is able to enjoy Christmas and the new year as we all want to. So take care, everybody, and thanks for coming. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.